Hello and welcome everyone to the Varsity Tutors Curious World STEM Collection. Where to be honest, we're feeling a little left out right now. It is a party on Mars right now. Not only do we have the Perseverance rover joining some other rovers from NASA, but China's gotten into the mix. The UAE sent or a, a, a orbiter, not quite a rover, but there's all kinds of things happening on Mars and humans for the time being are a little bit left out. That's why we're excited to have Abby Harrison here, astronaut Abby, as you may know her, an astrobiologist, co-founder of the Mars Generation, and someone who's clearly on a mission to Mars to help us figure out what we need to do to get there when humans get to join in on the party. Now, a couple things before we get started. One big thing about going to Mars is communication. We need to be able to stay in touch with mission control and all those kinds of things. That's true here today as well. We're gonna keep this really interactive. You probably see the chat box to the right of the screen. Abby's gonna ask you a ton of questions to find out what you know about Mars, what you think about Mars and what your hopes and dreams are concerning Mars. Please use that chat box early and often to answer as many of her questions as you have answers for. Also, she's got answers for you to questions you have. So please, at any given time throughout tonight's presentation, ask questions in that chat box there. And in the last 10 minutes or so, I'll interview Abby with your questions so we can get answers to all of your burning questions about Mars and about the Mars generation. Last thing, make sure you've got a camera nearby because in about half an hour, we're gonna give everybody an opportunity to lean into the screen and take a space selfie with Abby. If you upload that to Instagram and tag Abby and Varsity Tutors, we'll have the official handles up on a slide on the way out. You'll be entered to win a copy of Abby's book, Dream Big, and I should say a signed copy, actually, I kind of buried the lead there, and a free entry in Curious World STEM Club with Varsity Tutors this summer, where you can tinker with astrobiology, space exploration, and all kinds of other topics. So with all that said, uh, we have been cleared for liftoff, so it's my honor to turn it over to your teacher for today, astronaut Abby, Abby Harrison. Hi everyone, and thanks so much, Brian and Varsity Tutors, and a big special thank you to all our space cadets who have joined us today to learn all about Mars. As Brian mentioned, my name is uh, Abby, or as I'm more commonly known, Astronaut Abby. I'm not an astronaut yet, but I'm trying really hard to become one, and who knows, maybe someday in the future I'll be walking on Mars, and you might be there with me. But the first step in any of that is learning about Mars, and that's exactly what we're going to do today. As you can see, we've got a couple different uh, topics that we're going to talk about with Mars. The very first thing that we're going to do is we're going to just get to know Mars a little bit better, get more close and personal with Mars, learn some differences, some similarities, and really start to think about what it is that makes Mars so incredible. And so to do this, we're going to start out with a quick game about Mars. And so what will happen is this game is called called Earth or Mars, who does it better? And I'll be asking you a series of questions. And after I ask the question, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait for a little bit and give you a, a little bit of time to type your answer into the chat box. So please do that. Answer if you think it's Earth, if you think it's Mars, or if you have other ideas that you want to throw out there. And then I'll tell you what the right answers are. Um, and if you want, you can tally those up but we won't be checking that at the end. This is really a fun informal way just to think a little bit more about how incredible Mars is. So for our very first, who does it better question, who is older, Earth or Mars? Okay, so I'm definitely, uh, this is a little bit of a hard one. It's a little bit of a tricky question. Um, but I'm seeing some, some people are saying Mars, some people are saying Earth. And I, I, have to, I have to break it to you that Mars wins on this one. As much as I love Earth, Mars is in the lead right now. Mars is a little bit older than Earth. Uh, Earth and Mars actually formed at very similar times um, from the planetary accretion disk that was around our sun when it was really early in the solar system uh, or the formation of the solar system. But Mars stopped adding material to its planetary body about I think it was 100 million years earlier than Earth did, which is one of the reasons why Earth is so much larger than Mars. So to everyone who said that um, Mars was older, you got it right. To everyone who thought Earth was older, you were really, really close on that one. But we'll move on to our next question. So our next question is, who, which planet gets to claim the highest mountain peak? Let's see. So this is another one that might be a little bit tricky. 
And the correct answer, which a lot of you are getting, uh, I guess, wow, a lot of you know a lot about Mars already. This is great. So the, the correct answer is that Mars has the highest mountain and it actually has the highest mountain peak within our entire solar system, Olympus Mons, which is two and a half times higher than Mount Everest. Mount Everest is the highest mountain on our planet on Earth. Olympus Mons is two and a half times larger than Everest, which is insane and amazing. Okay, for our next one, and maybe, maybe Earth will win one at some point, but so far it's looking pretty good for Mars. So our next question is, which planet has the largest canyon? And similar, similar to the last one, I'm seeing, I'm seeing a lot of people who are answering Mars. Uh, very, very smart space cadets. I'd take any of you on, on my mission with me. Um, so Mars does, does win this one again. Valles Marineris is the largest canyon in the solar system. It's four times deeper than the Grand Canyon. And in some areas, it's as wide as 2,400 miles across, which is just an insane amount of distance to think about. Okay, so we'll move on to the next one. Which planet eclipses, if you see what I, what I did there, which planet eclipses the other in moon count? So which planet, Earth or Mars, has more moons orbiting around it? Hmm. It's kind of a tricky one. So Mars wins this one as well. Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos, whereas Earth only has our one moon, which we're all familiar with from the night sky. OK, let's see. The next question, eye on the sky, who has the biggest moon? And this is one that, you know, Mars definitely won the last one of having two moons, whereas Earth only has one. But like some of you are getting in the comments, Earth finally wins one. Woohoo! <laughs> we had to win one at some point. Earth's moon is much bigger than either, uh, either of Mars's moons. Um, however, as we've seen from, from that game, and as all of you answered with your fantastic answers to those questions, um, Mars is really incredible. And Mars has so many features to it as a planet that are, are very different from Earth and very stunning and, and really exciting for us to think about exploring in the future as well. Um, so, oh, sorry, we actually have one more question. My mistake there. Um, so I guess we can't quite crown a winner between the two planets yet, but we're close. So which planet has the longest day? And this is, this is a question that um, it's really close. So for those of you who are answering Mars, uh, you did get it correct. Mars's day is just a little bit longer than Earth's day. Um, Mars, a Martian day comes in at 24 hours and 39 minutes. So really just a tiny bit longer than a standard Earth Day. So good job, everyone. Uh, those were some great questions. Now we're gonna move on and we're gonna play one more quick game before we, we really start talking about the nitty gritty elements of exploring Mars. And this game is called Similarities and Differences. And similar to the last one, um, in Similarities and Differences, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you a series of questions about Mars, about Earth, about uh, our solar system. And you have the option now of answering not just Earth or Mars, but both or neither as well. So we'll go ahead and we'll play a couple rounds of this. So which planet or who will someday have a ring like Saturn? OK, so this is one that's really interesting. And the reason behind it is, so the answer for this one is that someday Mars will have a ring like Saturn and it's really a cool answer. And a lot of you were getting that. It's great to see so many people who know so much about Mars. Um, but one of the reasons for that is because of uh, Mars having two um, moons who are orbiting at, one of them is orbiting at a much lower orbit. Uh, and in, in the future, those moons will um, likely break up and be able to help form those rings similar to the ones that we see around Saturn. So that's a really cool feature that it's a very long time in the future for Mars, but someday that could happen. Okay, so our next question, and we'll see if you guys can keep getting, getting so many of these spot on. Our next question is, which planet has a day that is approximately 24 hours long? And this one, if you've been paying attention, you should already know the answer to this one. This was a little bit of a, 
um, uh, an easy one that we threw in as well, because we already talked about how long Earth and Mars's days were. So as, as many of you are, are saying and are correct in, both Earth and Mars have um, days that are approximately 24 hours long. Mars's day is about 40 minutes, give or take a little bit longer than a standard day here on Earth. Great job, everyone. Okay, so the next question is, which planet has volcanoes? And I'll give, I'll give you a second or two to mull that one over because it's really a cool question to think about is which planet has volcanoes? So the correct answer, like a lot of you are finding out is both Olympus Mons, which we previously talked about, that, um, that mountain on Mars that is so much bigger than even our largest mountain here on Earth, Mount Everest, is also a volcano, which means that both Earth and Mars have that, which is really interesting. Okay, next question. Which planet has tornadoes? And this one's a little bit of a thinker as well. And the correct answer, I'll give you, I'll give you another second or two just to, to think through that one. It's really, in my opinion, this is one of my favorite questions that, that we're asking today. Um, okay, so here we go. Which planet has tornadoes? The correct answer is uh, Earth only, however, on Mars, you see dust storms that look a lot like tornadoes. So in order to have a tornado, you actually have to have liquid in the atmosphere. And Mars really doesn't have very much liquid in the atmosphere. However, Mars does have a very dusty surface and it has enough atmosphere. It has less of an atmosphere than Earth does, about one one hundredth of the atmosphere that we have. But that's still enough atmosphere to whip up some really incredible dust storms that can form a similar shape to tornadoes. All right, good job to everyone who's been, been you know, whizzing through these. This is awesome. Our next uh, question is which planet has hurricanes? And this one's similar to the last question in that water is really an important part of hurricanes. So that's a little bit of a hint and I'm seeing that a lot of you are keen in on the fact that only Earth has hurricanes. Mars does not have hurricanes because in order to have a hurricane, you actually have to have surface features of water such as oceans. Um, and so here's a good time for us to stop and, and have just a, a moment of a, I guess we could call it a sanity check or, or a moment where we think critically about Earth and Mars because so far we've talked about a lot of similarities and a lot of differences. And the reality is that while, while there are things about Mars that are quite similar, there are also so many things that are really unique and that are really different from Mars versus Earth. Um, and this is one of them that I think actually sounds pretty nice to not have to deal with hurricanes. If you've ever lived in an area with hur hurricanes, they mostly get a bad rap. You hear, you hear about the destruction that hurricanes can cause and about how um, disruptive they can sometimes be. But the truth of the matter is that hurricanes are a, an important part of the water cycle here on Earth. And they're really impactful to having <laughs> Excuse me, everyone. Speaking of water, <laughs> oh, excuse me. I got so excited about Mars that I just couldn't even handle it for a moment. But the truth is that hurricanes, they're not as bad as they seem when you think about the fact that they're integral to the water system and cycle here on Earth. The reason that they don't exist on Mars is, again, because there are no large bodies or, or bodies of water at all on Mars. That's really a feature of Mars that is um, something we'll talk about a little bit more uh, as we move on to future portions of our, our exploration today. But keep that in mind, there's no surface water on Mars that we've been able to find yet. Okay, so we have a couple more questions before we finish up our first or our second game. Um, our next question is, which planet has four seasons due to being tilted on its axis in relation to the sun? And this is, this is a really interesting one, I think. And I'll, I'll give you guys a, a minute, a couple seconds to start typing your answers into the chat bar, letting me know what you think. I'm seeing some of Mars, some people are saying Earth, and some people are saying both, 
which is the correct answer. Of course, we all know that we have four seasons here on Earth, but the truth is that we also have four seasons on Mars. They are not quite as dramatic as they'd be on Earth. And one of the reasons for that is that you get a lot fewer, a lot less weather on Mars than you would get on Earth due to there being a much uh, um, thinner atmosphere and an atmosphere that doesn't have as much water in it. You don't get things like snow or rain or those types of things. Um, however, there are four seasons on Mars and those four seasons are caused by the axial tilt of the planet in relation to the sun. So good job, everyone. All right, so for our next question for the game, we're gonna ask which planet often has temperatures below zero degrees Fahrenheit? And this is a question that for people who live in the Southern hemisphere or more sunny and tropical areas, you might want to say just Mars, but the real answer, which I'm seeing a lot of you say is actually both planets. Both planets can frequently get below zero degrees Fahrenheit. It's much more often or common for Mars to be in that much lower temperature. And part of the reason for that is that Mars, as we've mentioned a couple times so far, doesn't have as much atmosphere as Earth does, which um, essentially means that it's not able to trap and hold as much heat as Earth does, as much um, energy from the sun. And therefore it's a lot more difficult for Mars to keep its temperature up. Uh, but the answer is definitely both planets. Good job. Okay, so we'll move on to our next question of the game, which is which planet has temperatures above 100 degrees Fahrenheit? So this question is kind of the opposite of the last one before we were talking about which planet dips down below zero frequently. And you guys did a great job of figuring out that it was both planets. Let's see what you say about this one, which gets above 100 degrees. So the correct answer here is Earth only. The highest temperature that we believe that Mars is able to get up to is around 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's not a very common temperature. You might be thinking, oh, that sounds really nice. Maybe we should have uh, vacation homes on Mars or something like that. But the truth of the matter is that for the majority of the planet during the majority of the seasons, it's not quite so warm and toasty on Mars. Um, but if you catch Mars on a nice sunny day at the equator during the Martian summer, it can get up to about 70 degrees. So definitely keep that in mind as we talk later on about potential habitability aspects. Temperature, as you've all found out, is going to be an important one. Okay, so for our next question, which planet has liquid water? And again, this is another question that is really going to be important as, as we um, talk further on about habitability and also especially as it relates to humans and humans potentially visiting Mars someday. So which planet has liquid water? I'm seeing answers that are all over the place here. I'm seeing somewhat, some people saying Earth, some people are saying Mars, some people, someone's saying Pluto. Pluto's not even a planet, come on. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. Um, so the answer here is that as far as we know, um, both planets do have liquid water. We're obviously certain that there's liquid water on Earth, but on Mars, there's a very small amount. Uh, we believe there's a small amount of liquid water that is seasonal. So for instance, the um, Mars has polar caps, polar ice caps. The Northern one is more comprised of water. The Southern one is more comprised of CO2, but does have some water in it as well. And like we mentioned earlier, Mars goes through seasons. And as Mars goes through seasons, those ice caps also freeze and warm and freeze and warm a small amount. And that's where we believe that some of the liquid water on Mars comes from. But the majority of the water that's on Mars is trapped in, in frozen polar ice caps, or um, there's a very small amount of water that's within the Martian uh, atmosphere. And it's also believed that there's actually some water that's trapped deep within the surface of Mars um, that early on in, in Mars's history was kind of sequestered there. So that's really um, an interesting thing. But the takeaway, which you all seem to get by, by this question, the takeaway is definitely that Earth has a lot more water and a lot more easily accessible water than Mars does. Okay, let's move on to our next question, which is, oops, 
sorry, I already gave this one away. So if you've been listening, you should be able to get this one hands down. Which planet has polar ice caps? And I won't, I won't leave too long on this one since we already talked about it a little bit with the previous question. So both planets have polar ice caps and the composition of them is a little bit different. Like I mentioned, one of Mars's polar ice caps is actually formed primarily out of frozen carbon dioxide, which is really interesting, but not so helpful when we're thinking about where's the water. Good job, everyone. We have just a couple more questions in our game. So our next question is, which planet has rivers, lakes, and rainstorms? And I know you're noticing at this point that there's a theme going on here where we're talking a lot about water and especially surface, ge surface features that include water. And the reason for that is because water is so important and so essential to life. Okay, now that I've given you a little bit of time to think about which planet has rivers, lakes, and rainstorms, I'm seeing answers. I'm seeing that most of these answers are saying Earth only, and that is the correct answer here. Like we said earlier, Mars does have some water on it, but most of the water that you'd find on Mars is really inaccessible. It's in difficult kind of tucked away places. Whereas on Earth, we can walk outside and uh, get rained on or go visit the, the river or um, go visit the ocean. Just, you know, I like Mars. Mars is definitely my, uh, my second favorite planet, but I have to say that nothing quite beats the water system here on Earth, even for a total space nerd like me. Okay, so for our next question, which planet has an atmosphere that is rich in carbon dioxide? And I'll give you a second or two, a couple seconds to think about this one a little bit and to really mull it over which planet has an atmosphere that's rich in carbon dioxide. I'm seeing some people are saying Mars, some people are seeing Earth, and I'm also seeing a lot of people saying both, which is the correct answer. Although on Earth, we might not want to have quite as much carbon dioxide in our atmosphere as we do. So keep that in mind. <laughs> Um, and now we have our, our last question before we conclude our game um, comparing Earth and Mars, which is which planet has an atmosphere that's rich in oxygen? So the last question we asked about which planet had an atmosphere that was rich in carbon dioxide. Now we're gonna talk about oxygen. And I'm really glad to see that I'm mostly seeing people who are coming in and saying that Earth is the only planet that has an atmosphere that's rich in carbon dioxide. This is super important um, because again, not only do we need water, we, us as in humans and most other forms of life, not only do we need water, but we also need oxygen in order to survive. And so that's something that because Mars doesn't really have very much of it, when we go to Mars in the future, me and who knows, maybe some of you, we'll have to not only bring some of our own water with us um, in addition to using potentially some of the water that's available on Mars, but we'll also have to supply our own oxygen, either by bringing it with us or finding ways to extract oxygen from the resources that are available on Mars. Something, something to think about, definitely one of the big questions that we have. Um, and so the takeaway though, is that Mars has, it does have a lot of similarities to Earth, but it also has a lot of differences. And those differences are the things that make it so interesting and exciting to explore actually. Um, and that's a big part of what we'll be talking about today is not only what are those differences, we've already gone through, through the game, the games, which you all did a stellar job at, but we've talked about what those differences are we're gonna move on in, in some of the future, um, our future conversations and discussions. We're gonna instead talk about what do those differences actually mean, both for the future of exploration on Mars through robotic means and for the future of exploration on Mars through human, uh, human means. So now that we're all experts, like I said, on the similarities and differences, here's my big question for you. Why do you think that we should be sending humans to Mars? And some of the answers that, um, that I can think of, one of the biggest answers actually is just because Mars is so incredible and so amazing. And like I said, it is so different in so many ways from, from Earth. 
And there's so much that we can learn about our own solar system. As we mentioned, Mars has more moons than we do. We can learn about formations of moons and uh, planetary formation and all of those types of things by ex uh, exploring Mars. We can learn about the geological history of the early ages of our solar system by exploring Mars and by contrasting and comparing its features to those here on Earth. We can learn so much about the history and potentially also the future of where our solar system as a whole, and especially these inner rocky planets, so planets like Earth, like Venus, like Mercury, and of course Mars are going in the future. The more we know, the better prepared we are to think about the future of our solar system as a whole. So that's definitely one reason is just because Mars is incredible and amazing and has a lot of really um, intriguing features to it. But the next reason, and this is my personal favorite reason as an astrobiologist, so someone who studies the potential for life elsewhere in, in the solar system and the universe, my favorite reason to explore Mars is the search for life and searching for and looking for not just current or, or present life, but also past life, life that may have existed billions of years ago on Mars or the potential for areas that life could exist in the future. Now, it's definitely possible that we'll find life within our solar system, whether it's on Mars or in the atmosphere of Venus or under the, uh, the icy crust of Enceladus or you know elsewhere within our solar system. But what's even more likely than that is that the more we explore and especially exploring places like Mars that have had such rich and interesting geological histories and surface feature histories, the more we explore those is that we might find evidence of past life. So life that existed, like I said, billions of years ago and doesn't exist anymore. There's a lot of speculation and a lot of potential um, out there within the scientific community about what Mars looked like a couple billion years ago. And until we explore further, we really won't know. So that's a great reason for us to continue to explore Mars, to search further. Um, it's my favorite reason, but I'll leave it up to you to decide what your favorite reason is. And it might not even be any of the ones that I talk about today. There, I, I'm only going to be going over the big, the, the big couple of main ones, but there are so many reasons. So I really would um, strongly emphasize, keep thinking about that. Keep thinking about what your favorite reason to explore Mars might be. Go ahead and type it into the chat if you want to and share it with us. Um, but so here's, here's one more really big reason. And this I think kind of rounds out the top three, which is, because it's there. And this is a famous quote from um, George Mallory, who was a really incredible mountaineer who did a lot of exploration on Mount Everest here on Earth. And when asked about exploring Mount Everest, um, his answer of why was because it's there. And I really think that it might sound a little bit silly to say that because something is there is enough of a reason to explore it and to, to set our sights on it and to set our goals on it. But when it comes to something like Mars and especially in terms of space exploration, it is, it is enough of a reason. It is a full goal and a full reason to say, because it's there, we are going to try. We are going to look at something that seems like it might be impossible. And instead we're gonna say, how can we make that possible? And a really big part of what makes that so necessary to look at and say, how can we how can we explore that challenge is because it's a part of the human spirit. We've always been explorers. We've always been asking what's around that next bend? What's over that next hill? How can we further understand the world and the, the solar system and the universe around us? And Mars is really the next step in finding those answers and continuing our exploratory spirit as humans. And in addition, in case you needed another reason to explore Mars just because it's there, the, the final reason, and this is a really impactful one to want to explore Mars, is because it's challenging. Because Mars challenges us. It pushes our boundaries of what we're capable of doing. And it causes us to think about things in, in a new way, to shift our perspective, to develop technologies that are different than anything we've ever needed before. And we've seen this time and time again in space exploration, that as we 
as we explore space, the things that we develop in order to deal with the harsh and inhospitable conditions of space actually come back and help us here on Earth. They help us to improve our lives and to improve our stewardship and our, our, our um, participation here on our planet. So it's, for example, some of the things that we've, uh, you know, developed in the past through space exploration that have really helped us to take care of Earth and to find future solutions have been insulation. And that's kind of a surprising one, but insulation that's used, that was originally developed for space exploration is now used here on Earth to make sure that homes and, and places of business and other um, residential type areas don't need to be heated and cooled as frequently and instead can maintain their temperature and more of a homeostasis. Another really incredible piece of technology that's been impacted massively by space exploration and then has come back to help change life here on Earth is solar power. And so the International Space Station, for example, um, has incredibly advanced and sophisticated solar, solar panels that help to power the station and has been integral in helping us to understand how we can better utilize our resources in a more um, sustainable way here on Earth. And so these are the kinds of things that you look at and you say, we've already explored so much and discovered so much in space that has been able to help us here on Earth how much more can we explore and discover if we really push our boundaries? If we say to ourselves, it's time to do something that we've never done before. It's time to leave low earth orbit. It's time to go somewhere farther than earth orbit, to go not just to um, orbit around earth or to our own moon. It's time instead to visit another planet and especially to put humans on another planet. When you look at that and think about that, I also challenge you then to think about how incredible the technological advances will have to be in order to allow us to be successful and then how those technologies will be able to improve and change life here on earth. So keep that thought in mind throughout the rest of our, our exploration today. Um, I, I really would challenge you to, to keep that in mind and to think not about Mars as a planet B or a plan B planet, but instead to think about Mars as a way for us to take care of our own home and a way for us to discover and explore ways that we can continue on Earth in a more sustainable way. Okay, so now that we've talked about how incredible and interesting Mars is, and we've also talked about some of the um, reasons why we might want to explore Mars. We've decided, okay, yes, we're gonna go there. It's an incredible place. We wanna go explore it and discover new technologies to feed the human spirit, to really push our boundaries. The next question is, how are we going to get to Mars? And that's a really big question. And I'm super excited to get to share some of the things that are currently being done and to talk about some of the problems and challenges that still face us in the future that will help us to actually put humans on the surface of Mars. And so the first thing to keep in mind is that in a way, we're already on Mars. Uh, obviously, I don't mean you and me because you and me are sitting here having this awesome conversation about Mars, but I mean that we as humans have already put our footprint on Mars, or I guess you could say, our tread print instead, and that's through rovers. We've been able to explore Mars through both orbiters, so spacecraft that stay in orbit around Mars, and by actually landing rovers on the surface of Mars. And most recently, uh, the, the rover that is currently exploring the Martian surface, um, or one of them, is Perseverance. And so I think uh, this would be a good time for us to take a little bit of a pause and, and reflect about what is your favorite thing that you have seen from Perseverance. And it's totally okay. Go ahead and, and put your answers into the chat bar, type them. And it's totally okay if your response to that is, hold on, Perseverance? I'm not familiar because we'll talk about it. You will be familiar. Um, but go ahead and put those into the chat bar for sure. Okay. so. Seen a lot of great um, responses here. Some people are some people are not super familiar with perseverance, which totally makes sense. But a lot of you have actually seen, and this is one of my favorites. Um, I'll call out two two responses that I'm seeing that are 
two of my favorite things that Perseverance has already um, worked on accomplishing, which is the Ingenuity helicopter that Perseverance actually brought with it to Mars, which was the first time ever that there has been powered flight on a planet, not Earth, so on, on a different planet within our solar system. And that wasn't once, it wasn't twice, I believe it's been five times now that NASA has flown the Ingenuity helicopter on the surface of Mars. This is incredible to think about, not just because it's a technological feat that's really difficult in a place with such a thin atmosphere as Mars, but also because the implications of having powered flight on Mars are incredible for when you and I go and visit in the future. This means that we're going to be able to use helicopters and air support to um, scout areas out and to really look for and identify what the most exciting and interesting areas are going to be for us to explore in the future, which is such an incredible way to look at humans and robotics working together to make the most of our explorations of the surface of Mars. Another really cool response that I'm seeing some of you mention, and I call this out because it's one that's uh, a favorite of mine as well, is MOXIE, which is a um, an experiment that was on the Perseverance rover, which was essentially taking uh, resources that already exist on Mars and trying to extract usable resources that we might be able to harness in the future. And in particular, MOXIE was pulling oxygen out from Mars, which is super important, not just because humans need oxygen in order to survive anywhere we go, but also because oxygen can be an important feature of rocket propellant, which would make things a little bit easier for Mars if, um, or for human exploration of Mars in the future if we don't have to bring all of our supplies with us. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in the future when we talk about transportation issues with getting to and from Mars. But for now, it's good to think about the fact that so far we've been able to make incredible strides in exploring and discovering Mars through our robotic partners. However, there are differences between humans and robots. And um, this is where I'll ask you again, go and type your answers to this or your thoughts and ideas. And there's no wrong answer here, but go ahead and type those into the chat bar. I wanna see what you think about this. What are some things that you think that people will need when we go to Mars that Perseverance and our other robotic explorers don't need? Now I'll give you a little bit of time, just a couple seconds to think that over because it's a, it's a big question to ask, what is it that humans need that robots don't? And there are a lot of answers to this. So let's start looking at some of them. So some of the things that humans need, which we've already mentioned are oxygen, water, uh, some that we haven't quite mentioned yet, but these are really good points are shelter and food and medical supplies and all kinds of things like that. Um, so Perseverance and, and other robotic exploration is currently working on the oxygen, the water, the transportation, all of these kinds of things, helping us to explore Mars in a way that'll make it more applicable or more attainable, I guess you could say, for us as humans to go and explore in the future. Um, but we also have some, you know, some some big questions still outstanding of how we're going to go about making Mars um, a place that humans can go and explore as well. And so uh, one of the big things that you have to think about in terms of future exploration on Mars is all of these things that we can't take, that we can't um, attain once we're on Mars. So things like, yes, we might be able to get some oxygen, but we'll probably still need to bring some with us. And the same goes for water. And then you get started on things like food production, medication, um, shelter, uh, research materials, all of these different things that you could imagine needing on the surface of Mars. We're gonna have to bring most of those with us. And that becomes a little bit of a big question when you're talking about supplies. Um, and so the answer here is that the, well, one, there are many answers to be considered here, but one of the big thoughts in the scientific community currently about how we're going to handle this problem of having to have large amounts of supplies that we bring with us to Mars in order to support human missions in a successful way is that we might have to deliver them separately and um, we might have to deliver them before humans even 
uh, launch from Earth to go to Mars. So the idea is that um, instead of showing up with all of your supplies, we might have already been doing supply drops or deliveries on Mars in the years leading up to a human mission. And that way, you know for sure that when you show up, all of your supplies will already be there ready and waiting for you so that you can hit the ground running and really make the most of your time on Mars. Um, another really important thing that we have to think about when we're talking about the future of hopefully human missions to Mars is transportation. And this is especially important when you think about the fact that, as we've already mentioned and talked about, humans need a lot more supplies than robotic explorers do. And that means that the cargo that we are taking from Earth to Mars and potentially back again is going to be much larger and much, um, much heavier to launch from Earth, which is more expensive and more resource intensive. But it's also going to be much more difficult to land on the surface of Mars. This is one of the really big questions out there currently about human missions to Mars in the future is how are we going to handle um, these types of landing scenarios? And so the reason that that's so difficult is because unlike the moon, where the moon has no atmosphere, so when we send humans to the moon, they were able to, and in the future when we return back to the moon, they were able to use something called retro rockets, which is essentially as your spaceship is coming down towards the planet, you fire rockets in the opposite direction to slow your descent. Now, that doesn't work so well on Mars because Mars has too much of an atmosphere, which means that as you're firing those retro rockets, you'd end up having all kinds of problems with large amounts of turbulence being, um, being expressed through that. So you have to be really careful with retro rocket usage. Now, the other question might be, can't we just land the same way that we do on Earth and use um, the Earth's atmosphere in order to slow us down and to, to slow our descent? Sadly, while Mars has enough atmosphere to cause problems for retro rocket landings, it doesn't have enough atmosphere to really make a, a really significant or enough of a difference to slow a spacecraft as it exits from orbit. So that's something that we can't quite rely on that either. And the third thing that makes landing on Mars really difficult is actually just the distance between Earth and Mars, which, um, the distance between Earth and Mars is so great that you actually have a communication lapse as well. It takes so long for a signal traveling at the speed of light to reach Mars and then return back to Earth that sometimes you can have communication delays of up to 30 minutes and occasionally more depending on where Earth and Mars are in relation to one another in their orbits. And what this means for entry, landing, entry, descent, and landing on Mars is that you actually have to pre-program everything that you want to happen in the landing and you're not able to react in the moment to changes in circumstances or situations, which is just another level of added um, difficulty for a future mission to Mars. And so these, these problems might all sound insurmountable. You might be asking, but Abby, how are we ever going to land enough supplies and um, large enough vehicles to contain humans on the surface of Mars? And the answer for that is that there are incredible technologies that are being explored currently. And that um, every time that we land a payload on the surface of Mars, we develop those technologies even further. So for example, when we watched the last rovers landing on Mars, we were able to use really innovative technologies such as sky cranes and combinations of lower amounts of retro rockets and other kinds of landing um, technologies in order to make that possible. And so currently we don't have the capabilities yet to land large enough payloads to support humans, but I have no doubt that with all of the brilliant minds at work now and in the near future on this problem that we will, we'll be able to figure out the transportation and supplies issues. Okay, so speaking of landing, your mission to Mars is all planned out. You're ready to go. You've decided why you want to go there. You've decided how you're gonna get there. And the, the next question that I, I pose to you and that I'd ask you is, where are you going to land? And what types of things should you take into consideration when you're thinking about where to land on your, uh, your 
let's say your very first mission to Mars. So I'll give you, I'll give you a couple of seconds to mull that question over and to start typing some ideas and some thoughts into the chat bar. And then I'll talk about a couple of the different things that I thought about as well as some of the things that I see from you guys. So some of the some of the things that I, I'm seeing some people mention is that you want to land in an area that's safe. So you want to land somewhere where you're not landing on top of any um, really large boulders or, or rock formations that might be damaging to your spacecraft. And I'm glad to be seeing that one because that is absolutely one of the things that you consider um, when you're when you're thinking about where to land a payload on Mars, whether that payload is robotic or human, it's super important to choose a safe landing site to not have any super large rock formations, to not have any steep um, steep hillsides or large craters or anything like that that might cause damage to your spacecraft and your payloads. That's a really important one. Another answer is that you'll probably, and this is even more important for humans than it is for robotics, but you know, you and me, when we're going to Mars in the future, um, we're probably going to want to try and land closer to the equator of Mars, so closer to the, the center of the planet in terms of um, latitude. And the, the reason for that, or sorry, yeah, yeah, latitude. And the reason for that is because like we talked about earlier when we were playing our games, comparing Earth and Mars and answering questions about the two, Mars does have four seasons. And those seasons are most temperate and the climates are, are most easy to, um, to withstand as, as the different seasons progress at the central uh, latitude, so near to the equator. So that's definitely the place that will be the most comfortable and easiest for humans to live and work in. Similarly, when you're landing on Mars, you have to think not just, not just about trying to find a safe place to land, but you also have to ask yourself, why did we decide to go to Mars in the first place? And so if your goal in going to Mars is to research geological features and explore the geological past history of the planet, then you'd want to choose a potentially different landing site from if your goal was to search for evidence of present or past life forms. Those things, you know, you might be, and you definitely could find landing sites that meet both of them, but depending on which of those you're choosing, or if you're choosing a completely different reason to go and explore Mars, you'll have to really keep that in mind and think about that as part of your decision of where to land. Um, and one of the things there that's important is that once you land on Mars, it's a little bit difficult to travel across the, the planet surface. And um, so you wanna land pretty close to the area that you want to study and live. And you also wanna land pretty close to any supplies that you might have previously dropped as well so that you can start to utilize those as soon as possible to make your mission a success. So those are just some ideas. There's all kinds of different ideas and I, I've seen already so many more than we could possibly talk about today going through the chat so many great ideas of everything from feasibility to research to climate to all of these different aspects that are super important for talking about landing on mars however we don't have quite enough time to go into all of them today but the good news about this is that and bear with me because this might not sound like good news quite yet but the good news about this is that human missions to mars are still a ways down the road we're not ready to pack our bags tomorrow and head out to the red planet, uh, even though some of us may want to. Um, we're not quite technologically there yet. And I think that that is one of the most exciting and really one of the best parts about Mars is that everyone who's alive today has the opportunity to be a part of Martian exploration, be a part of creating the technologies and the systems necessary to go there and to explore Mars in the near future. And who knows, those of us who are alive today, if, all, if everything works out, we might even get to be the very first humans to walk on Mars. And you've already joined me in helping to make these future Mars missions possible just by coming and joining me today to explore and to learn more and to think more about Mars. So keep it up. We'll have some time for questions to talk a little bit more about anything that might be lingering on your brains in, in relation to Mars. But I'll leave it with a very heartfelt thank you for joining me today for learning about Mars. 
Abby, thank you. This was so fun to watch the chat. Thanks to, to Abby, but to everyone who's part of the Mars generation as, uh, as the foundation and the patch uh, talk about there. It's uh, just so fun to see the future astronauts of the world collaborating, sharing ideas of where they're going to land and what they want to think about and what things are important. Um, a huge congratulations to all of you out there for being part of that exploration and getting ready for the Mars exploration. A um, couple things we need to take care of here. We mentioned uh, it was time to, to get some pictures going. So if everybody wants to, uh, to log into those phones, get yourself picture ready. Uh, we're going to take a picture with Abby here in just a second. Um, again, we can lean into the screen, get that photo. Uh, I'll queue you up when we're ready. Remember, if you take that picture and upload it to Instagram, it's so fun. So many of you have been to a lot of these classes about space before. I'm sure a lot of you are dressed up in an astronaut gear, quite like uh, Abby is here. And it's always so fun to see all those. If you upload an Insta to Instagram and tag Abby and Varsity Tutors, you'll be entered to win a copy of Abby's book, which I'm told we've got nearby right here, uh, which, uh, which will be fantastic. Uh, dream big. And then also an entry in Curious World STEM Camp this summer with Varsity Tutors, where you'll develop some of the skills necessary to, uh, to become an astronaut, to become an astrobiologist, if some of you are wondering what that was, you're going to get that question answered in just a second. So um, be ready. I think I've given you enough time to log into those phones and, uh, and get those smiles ready. So Abby, I'm going to turn it back to you. Let's get everybody a, a great picture they can put up online here in just a second. Abby, take it away. All right. Awesome. Thank you all so much. And please, like, like Brian mentioned, please do share your pictures with me. I'm super excited to, to get to see all of you and your, your fantastic smiling future Martian faces. So let's go ahead and we'll take a couple of pictures here. First one's a thumbs up for Mars, right? And then we'll go ahead and, and like mentioned, one of the prizes in addition to the really awesome camp that you can win is also a signed copy of my book, Dream Big, How to Reach for Your Stars. All right, and then uh, we'll, do, we'll do another, yeah, another picture smiling. All right. Does that seem like uh, we probably got it all? I think we got them, Drew. And also, everybody know when uh, Abby's at answering your questions, I'm going to put her on full screen. Um, she's pretty animated and, uh, and uh, smiles <laughs> a lot when talking about Mars and just space in general. So, uh, so no, but you'll have uh, more opportunities where that came from. If, uh, if you want to get a couple extra pictures to make sure you get the perfect one for the ground. Um, a lot of great questions out here. Um, one, one that I think a lot of people wanted to know, we introduced you as an astrobiologist. What does an astrobiologist do? I think we love both words, astro and biologist. What happens when you put them together, Ed? Yeah, so that's such a great question, and I'm really glad that it was asked. So an astrobiologist is essentially someone who studies life in space. And the really exciting things about that is that astrobiology can refer to what happens to life that we intentionally put into space. So everything from the smallest of microbes or single celled organisms, all the way up to a full human. Astrobiologists can absolutely be people who look at how life exists and works in space. But the flip side of that is that astrobiologists are also people who study life that we didn't put in space on purpose, but that might just exist there on its own. So the search for extraterrestrial or alien life forms. And that's the kind of astrobiologist that I am, is someone who actually my, my past research experiences um, was searching for potentially habitable environments on the near surface of Mars. And so uh, that's a really, it's really such an interesting topic and subject. And one thing I always have to mention when I talk about the search for alien life is that when you think about aliens, what do you think about the most often? You're probably thinking of something with green skin who's roughly as big as we are and has eight eyeballs and six arms and something like that, which is really fun to think about that if we were to find aliens, they might look like that. But the reality is that the first life forms that we find within, hopefully within our solar system, won't be much like that at all. They'll most likely be single cellular organisms, much more similar to a bacteria or a virus or those types of things that we're familiar with from, from here on earth. And an astrobiologist's job is to look for past uh, presence of those and current presence and who knows, maybe even future. 
I like that. And that you mentioned before, we may find, you know, we're going to dig deep and see if we find evidence from a long time ago, uh, you know, the potential for life. I think the, the fact that, you know, these planets are always changing is uh, something that, you know, we got to keep in mind that, you know, what Mars looks like today versus 100 million years ago, right? If you came to Earth today, you know, you wouldn't see dinosaurs, but they were here, um, which actually brings me to another one of my favorite questions um, is sort of a, a combo. A lot of people wanted to know why is Mars red? And then another, there were a few people out there. It was cool to see all these is, will Mars always be red? Will it turn another color? Someone mentioned, you know, maybe it'd be green or purple. You know, I guess we, you know, maybe maybe thought by the idea that it may get uh, get a ring. Um, can you tell us why is Mars red and will it always be red? And if not, what might happen? Yeah, so those are such fun questions and they really are important to talk about because, I mean, Mars being red is a big part of how we think about the planet. When you look up in the night sky to try and find Mars and to distinguish it, um, not even using a telescope, but just with your eyes to distinguish it from a star, the way you do that is actually by looking for a slightly reddish tinged star. So even when we're looking at it just with our bare eyes, we can already see that kind of reddish color. Um, I'm a big fan of the red Mars, which is why my flight suit, usually you see astronauts who are wearing blue flight suits. I wear a red flight suit because I'm not an astronaut yet, but you dress for the job you want and the job I want is on the red planet. Um, but so the, the reason behind that, and like I said, such a good question. The, the main reason behind that is because the regolith, so that's what we call soil when it's on Mars or, or on a planet or a, a moon that is not Earth. Um, we call soil here soil because it's, it has a lot of organic particles and pieces to it as well that help to make up the composition of the soil. Soil on other planets doesn't have all of those organic bits, so instead we call it regolith. The regolith on um, Mars has a lot of iron in it, and when that iron interacted with oxygen within Mars's atmosphere, which it does have a little bit of oxygen currently in the atmosphere. And in the past, it's believed that it had significantly more oxygen. Um, when those interactions happened, it had the effect of um, changing the chemical structure of some of the regolith on Mars and, and kind of oxidizing it in a certain way, which caused some of that more prevalent burnished red color uh, that you see on the surface. So that's such a fun question. It's really, really great. Thanks for asking it, for sure. Oh, of course. And then actually just a quick follow-up, quick answer so we can get to more of these. Someone even just asked, um, on Mars, when you look up, do you see a red sky? We see a blue sky here. What would you see in the sky on Mars? Yeah, so that's a really great question as well. The, um, the sunset that you would see on Mars would look a little bit different. Um, I'm trying to remember exactly what color it would be. Um, I'll have to double check what exactly it would look like because uh, it's been a while since I've looked at one of those photos, but the it definitely would have a different color tinge to it than it would here on Earth. And one of the big reasons for that is, is uh, or two reasons you could say, is because the composition of the Martian atmosphere is so different from the composition of Earth's atmosphere. So like we mentioned during the game that we played, Earth has much more oxygen in our, its atmosphere. It also has um, more trace elements of different things. Uh, whereas Mars has an atmosphere that's primarily composed of CO2. So that will definitely change the way that sunlight is filtered through the atmosphere. And the second reason for, for this change in appearance is because Mars has so much less atmosphere than Earth does as well. Just about one one hundredth of the atmosphere that you'd have here on Earth, um, which really is, it's not very much atmosphere. Uh, when you compare it to Earth, if you compare it to somewhere like the moon where they have no atmosphere, then it seems like a lot. Um, but I would, I would definitely recommend that everyone who's listening, uh, the, the very next step that you do after, after you log off of this is to go Google a Martian sunrise because uh, there's some really fantastic pictures out there and it'll help to, to make that connection to see it in, in person. And it's so amazing that we have the ability to uh, to do that, that there are images out there that uh, this is, it's not theoretical, it's real, it's happening. Perseverance and the other rovers are doing that for us. Um, hey, another common question, people are thinking about this trip. 
Um, and uh, so people are asking a lot of, are we there yet style questions, I guess. Um, how long does it take to get to Mars? Um, how long do you have to wait in order to maybe get back, right? We can't just go come and go when we please because we could be on opposite sides of a sun. Uh, and then how long is the delay? I always think it's fascinating that, you know, we send a message to one of our rovers right now. It takes a while to get there and then get back. Can you tell us a little bit about the time differences? How long does it take to get there? You know, how often do we even have the opportunity to get there back? And uh, what is that communications delay? It's pretty significant. Yeah, absolutely. So those are all really good questions. And what it comes down to is that Mars and Earth are much farther away from one another than anywhere else that we've explored uh, so far in our solar system. So far, the places that we've gone have been low Earth orbit and our own moon. And as you can imagine, our moon doesn't really get away from us. It never goes to the opposite side of the sun. Our moon is, is pretty locked into us, which makes traveling there much easier. However, as you mentioned, when you're thinking about going to Mars, you have to not just think about where the Earth is, but you also have to think then about where Mars is in relation to Earth. So Mars and Earth have different orbital periods. That means that it takes longer for Mars, uh, or it takes different amounts of time for them both to orbit around the sun. Uh, it actually takes longer for Mars to orbit around the sun. So a Martian year would be considered longer than an Earth year. And this means that, um, that there are some instances where as they're orbiting around the sun, they actually pass and become quite close to one another. And so you kind of have to wait for those, um, those lucky, lucky passings to happen in order to have the shortest trip to and from Mars. When you have that, that shortest possible distance between the two planets, it can take, uh, I think the, the rough estimate is anywhere from six to eight months. Even so, even at the shortest period between the two, six to eight months just to travel from Earth to Mars. And then once you get there, you either have to almost turn around pretty quickly or you have to wait on the surface for a couple of years before you can have another one of those close passings happen where the orbits of Earth and Mars line up really nicely uh, and you can come back. And what exactly that time period between, you know, the time that you go to Mars and the time you come back will be different um, depending on a number of factors. But those are the broad ranges of time that you're looking at is that for a mission to Mars, at the very minimum, you're looking at at least one year. And that can range all the way up to about three years of time that you might be spending in transit, on the surface, or returning back home. Uh, so the second part of the question, which is also really interesting, is about the time delay. So because Mars and Earth are so far apart from one another, you end up having this time delay where light and radio signals can only travel so fast. They can only travel at the speed of light at least as far as we know so far. Anything's possible in the future. Um, and that's how you know that I read a lot of sci-fi. Uh, but currently, as far as we know, we can only travel as fast as the speed of light. And that means that any type of signal that we send, whether it's audio or light-based or anything between the two planets, um, will take a certain amount of time. And so the average Again, it really depends and changes based on how close or how far apart Mars and Earth are in their orbits around the sun. But the average that it comes out to is about 20 minutes. And that's not 20 minutes round trip. That's not you send a, a message to Mars and you get a message in, in return 20 minutes later. That's you send a message to Mars and it takes 20 minutes before they receive it on the planet. And then it takes another 20 minutes for them to send a message back as well. So it's quite a time delay. And it really um, is one of the reasons that it's so compelling to want to send humans to Mars instead of continuing forever with robotic exploration is that it will fundamentally and drastically change the way that we explore Mars and the things we're capable of doing to have humans on the surface who are able to make split second decisions and who are able to process information and then make a decision about it immediately versus having a rover or an orbiter or something like that that is experiencing something, sending that data back and then having to wait to receive further instructions from humans.
Thank you for that. Yeah, it's amazing thinking of, you know, it seems close because so many of the pictures are, are we see are not drawn to scale and they, they show us the order of the planets and uh, those kind of things. Or even when, when they are to scale, we're looking at it all on the same side of the sun as opposed to thinking about, you know, Mars could be, it's sort of like if, you know, my sister lives in Chicago, but it's like, hey, sometimes Chicago would be in Beijing, kind of the way to think about it. It's not always, you know, it's not a fixed target. It could be in the other spot. Uh, hey, one yeah, last question. It's I really make fluid. Sure. Yeah, it's, oh, it's really Continue. amazing. Um, <laughs> What I want to make sure I get in is um, uh, Autumn and Aubrey are watching together in Colorado and they wanted to know, I think this is a, a great one. We talked about so many cool things about Mars. Everyone wanted to know, but they put their names on it. So I want to make sure they, they, uh, they get the credit. What's your favorite thing about Mars uh, and what are you most excited to see when you get there? That is such such a good question. Um, thank you, Aubrey and Autumn, for asking that. And thank you to everyone who's been asking fantastic and wonderful questions so far today. Um, it's really hard. It's really hard for someone who loves Mars as much as I do to have to to have to pick a favorite. That's like asking asking someone to pick their favorite book or asking you know your parents to pick their favorite child. Like you're not supposed to do it. But you asked, and so I'll tell you. My favorite thing about Mars is looking at the water cycle. And you might have gotten that from how much I talked about water earlier on and how focused I was on that. That's absolutely one of the things to me that is so incredible is this idea that billions of years ago, Mars possibly looked a lot like Earth. And there's definitely the possibility that there was large amounts of flowing water on the surface, that there was a water cycle like you see here on Earth that allows for oceans and streams and lakes and rain and hurricanes even, and all of these different things that are so necessary for life. It's, it's very um, realistic that those all existed on Mars at some point in the past, and that there are still signs that are just waiting for us to find and explore and discover them of what that past looked like, and that there's still the potential that water might exist um, at or near the surface of Mars currently that hasn't been ruled out. Um, like I said, there's the potential that it's been sequestered deep within the geological features, things like that. And so to me, that is, hands down, the most exciting part of going to Mars is really just delving in and uh, diving in, I guess, into that, that incredible history and potentially even incredible past of the water cycle on Mars. And um, I suppose I should mention as well that one of the reasons that that is just so interesting and exciting to talk about is because it's uh, it's not the only way that we can look for, for life. There are lots of different ways to look for life and also lots of ways to look for extraterrestrial life that might not need the same things that humans do or that earthbound life does. But it is definitely a common way that we, that we use as astrobiologists to help us in our search for where alien life might exist or might've existed in the past is by tracing the water. And so to be able to do that potentially in the near future on Mars is really such an exciting thing. Awesome. Well, you can definitely tell you're excited about it, just sort of <laughs> seeing it and feeling it in your voice when you talk about it. I guess maybe a way to think about it. Some people are hungry to get to Mars. Abby's thirsty to go to Mars. Got to check out the <laughs> Um, so, uh, sorry, dad jokes are uh, in the genes here. Um, huge thanks to all of you for your questions. Thanks to Abby for hanging out overtime with us to, uh, to answer more of those. Um, I know, uh, you know, it, it's still school night for some of you. Summer vacation may not have happened just yet, uh, or dinner time in other places. So we, uh, we'll cut it here. Abby's back, uh, later on in the summer for, uh, for another class with us. If you got questions that didn't get answered, hold on to them and, uh, and Abby will be back. Um, and uh, so huge thanks to all of you for your questions, um, for Abby, for all of her time and expertise. I think we're all really itching to, uh, to go to Mars. Um, on the way out, let me make sure uh, we share the contest rules with you. Um, remember, you've got the opportunity to win a signed copy of that book where there may be some answers to others, your questions, and a, a chance to get involved in Curious World STEM Campus Summer, which we hope you'll check out. There's a link on your screen to learn more about it. Only one person will win, but anybody can register. So we hope you see you there. As, uh, as Abby mentioned, you know, there's astrobiology involved in, uh, in, in the Mars exploration. There's geology, being able to, to look back in time by, uh, by looking at rocks. There's all physics, there's chemistry involved. And so um, Curious World STEM Club is a great place to build up all those skills, to be part of the mission to Mars when, uh, when your term arises. Turn arises. So with all that, huge thanks, Abby. Thanks to everyone out there and uh, we'll see everybody back soon.